up. Right now he's Roma doing Terry Funk in a bionic elbow. Sends him right out of the ring. Hello wrestling fans, we're back with another edition of a shoot interview series. Today we're joined by Dave and Earl Hebner. Welcome guys. Hey, thank, thank you. you. You're twins, so everybody go ahead and uh, identify themselves for the fans at home that are confused. I'm Earl Hebner. And I'm Dave Hebner. And uh, how did you both get started in wrestling? Well, we started back in Richmond, Virginia at the state fag rounds. We used to sell hot dogs. And then uh, we started helping the uh, Mernix set the ring up and uh, went on from there. Well, when did you first become a referee? You know, I would say 1963. Uh, well, what was the story that brought you from selling hot dogs to being a referee? It's a closed circle, so there must have been something that right. happened. Just, right? just the atmosphere there, you know? In the cattle building, when it was Rip Hawk, Sweet Handsome, those kind of guys, and I just wanted to be just so involved in it. Who actually started as a referee first? Dave. And uh, what, what was the story that led you to uh, actually becoming a referee? I mean, I, I, you explained like what it was about wrestling that attracted you to it, but uh, how did you get your start as a referee? Well, I knew I knew I was too small to wrestle, but I always figured, man, one of these days, you know, I'd really, really would like to referee. So I talked to uh, George Scott, who used to be the booker for uh, Crockett. He said, okay, one of these days when you get big enough, talk to me and maybe we can use you. Sure enough, 10, 10, uh, 10 years later, he said, no problem. So he sent me my first match was in Covington, West Virginia. It was uh, the Mongos, remember the Mongos? Mm -hmm. And uh, Johnny Weaver and uh, Abe Jacobs, tag team. That was my first match. Did you also want to be a wrestler at some point? No, I never wanted to be a wrestler. <clears throat> and, you know, when we was putting the rings up as kids, I, I really didn't care about being a referee. Oh, really? But as time went on, I was watching Dave, and I sort of liked it, so I decided that uh, I'd give it a shot. When you were fans, who were, uh, who were some of the wrestlers that you really enjoyed watching? Uh, Holly Race, uh, Jack Briscoe, Jerry Briscoe. Um, remember a guy by the name of Ike Hekins? Mm -hmm. um, a guy like that. Uh, and Rip Hall and Sweet Hanson were my favorites. So a lot of referees get their start because someone didn't show up and they just needed somebody to get in the ring that no. night. And uh, I would say most, most of your referees come from uh, like a family down, you know, like his dad was a referee, like uh, uh, Nick, you know, his dad is Joy Hamilton. Mm -hmm. His daddy used to be one of the bolos. And he come down the ladder, I guess, and his dad, he wanted to be a referee, I guess, because his dad was in the business. But we just got lucky. We got lucky. Uh, do you remember your first NWA match? Yeah. yeah. What about your first very, very big match, a high-profile match for the, for the NWA? Um, really, you know what? I was scared to do any big matches because not knowing, knowing what, you know, what was going on. Because when I started in, in the business, they, they didn't tell me nothing. Just count, one, two, three, you know. And plus, back then when Ric Flair and Holly Race, you know, that was a, those, those were pretty big matches. So they, they really needed a good referee. But back then, I look now, back then, uh, the referees really weren't that good. You, you, you saying, know, the, the, the guys off your own self in that statement, or are you just saying generally? I'm like, saying generally. A referee should should really be a young guy, a young guy that can keep up. Do you not think that an older uh, ref can bring more uh, prestige or honor to the match? Like a lot of people prefer to use older referees for that reason. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I think it's not so much as the age of the ref; it's it's the ref <coughs> himself. You can you can be young and be good, <coughs> or you can be old and be good. I'm old and I'm good. And that's, that's how I think, and I can move just as good as a young guy, and some of the young guys can move just as good as me. I don't think it's the age, I think it's, a, it's the way you handle yourself in, in, in the ring. There were circumstances that allowed, uh, Dave, you left and went to work for Vincent Mann, and then you stayed and continued to work for Crockett. Right. 
why, why was that? Why why did you guys not go as a package? Or? I don't think at the time they really didn't. I don't think it was even a thought of being a package. It was the package deal was the Hulk Hogan Andre Giant match. That was a package that got me there. But uh, so just four uh, four years later, but working. Well, then why did you leave Crockett? Why did I leave Crockett? Mm -hmm. Because I didn't like the way he was treating me. How how was he treating you? Terrible. I mean, they'd run Richmond. He sent me down to Spartansburg. I live in Richmond. Uh, go down to the Omni in Atlanta. But I'd drive from Richmond all the way to Atlanta and back. You know? So I quit. So was it was it just over the travel, or was, it, was he not paying you uh, what would be a fair rate for, you, for well, your services? The, 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 uh, yeah, I'd say the pay and plus the, the, the driving. I mean, you got uh, Tommy Young lives in Charlotte. You got him coming to Richmond. And you got me going to Spartansburg. Makes no sense. Why, why do you think uh, something like that happened? Do you think it's just they just didn't put any thought? Well, into no, it? I think because R uh, Richmond would outdraw Spartanburg, so they he he would send him to where they make the most money. So referees also like the wrestlers got paid based on, yeah. the, on the house. Right, on the house. And so Earl, you actually stayed with Crockett when when Dave had an opportunity to go to WWF. What? Would you categorize the way you were treated? Well, fairly the same. Uh, basically, uh, you know, I had my difference with Crockett, but she didn't make a lot of money there back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I just liked the business, and I had a regular job, so I would do my business on weekends, uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. What kind of business did you have? I worked in the construction business. W did you also have a, a side job? Or no. So you were making a living off just doing the But. Uh, you know, it was it was okay with me because I really wasn't that in love with it that at, at the time that much, and just to be able to referee now then was fine with me. And uh, Tommy Young was a good referee, and he's the one that really actually trained me and made me as good as I am today. And I say he is he is the best of all. What kind of things do you really need to learn to be a successful referee? You just need to you just need to know what's going on and and when to count and and where to be and just not be in the way and especially on TVs you can't have your your butt in front of the camera you work different ropes. Dave, what ultimately led to your break <coughs> getting into the WWF? Well, I think Ronnie Piper went to Vince and told Vince he knew a good referee because I was the first full-time referee hired in the WWF. I mean they had other referees they used different places but because it was such a, it was a commissioner outfit, so the commissioner had the referees, mm -hmm. which was bad. Because they don't work, you know. A, a good referee works for the company and work the boys every night. Here's a guy that might come once a month and work with the guys and not know nothing. Well, when did that rule? Was that was that most states' rule at the time where yep. you had to referee had to be yep. right New up? York, Philadelphia, places like that. What prompted that to change? Vince had it changed. He went under. Uh, uh, entertainment. And, uh, and Dave, you st uh, Earl, you stayed back in uh, the Crockett for several years. Right. right. Uh, would you say that the way that you were treated changed at all when, when uh, Dave left to go for WWO? Uh, not really, because they were just they were just the hard people. You know, Jimmy was a hard person. Crockett was a hard person. You know, he didn't have any heart for referees. I remember him telling uh, Tommy Young asked him one night. He says. Uh, you don't like Earl, do you? He said, no, furthermore, I don't like Earl, and I hate you, and some words are like that. So then when I did get a chance to go to uh, to uh, WWF back at, at the time, I remember Crockett saying, I can get referees down a dozen. So when it came, when it came time for me to leave, the, he was in a spot. He didn't. He couldn't get referees down a dozen. So loyalty was never a reason that you stayed with Crockett? As no, as no, no. It was just because I liked the business and wanted to be in it at the time. And I couldn't get a full-time job. Uh, I didn't want to move to, down to Charlotte, North Carolina, and they'd work Richmond, Charlottesville, Lynchburg, Fishersville, or pit up this way, where I could drive and, and be home by Monday morning to go to work. Right. And uh, ha what, was it just the twin angle when they finally said to you, "We, we have an idea, and then let's get your brother in here," or was it something that they had been planning for a while and they were just ready, waiting for the right opportunity? No. Nope. Vince came to me and said, uh, you know, he said, I like to shoot this angle because I, I guess he didn't want a, uh, a hawk to lose or 
Andre to his. So he said, man, this was your twin brother. I'd like to bring him aboard. So uh, he said, you think he'll come? I said, I'm pretty sure he will. So anyway, we flew her all up to Connecticut, and Vince picked us up, and uh, not Vince, but the driver picked us up, took, him, took us to his house. We talked everything over, got everything worked out. One of the biggest things ever in prefer, uh, professional wrestling. Sure. And talk about some of the differences, just as a, just as the way you were treated as a referee between Crockett and the way you were treated working for Vince McMahon. Well, up until I got fired, everything was great. I mean, it, it couldn't be uh, any better. I mean, you say uh, God's first, Vince McMahon is second. That's how good it worked to me. 24 years I worked for him, never missed a day. And I guess because I had such a good job, if I was sick, it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. I was treated good. I definitely was treated good. And all the promises that he would make, I mean, you mentioned that Crockett mentioned some stories about, you know, referees a dime a dozen. Right. You were never treated like that. No, no. no. Like Vince was... Vince was always good to me, uh, and truthfully, uh, uh, like I said, I was there for 17 years, so it was a, it was a family affair and, until the company actually went public, and then it, things began to change. But as far as uh, Vince himself and the McMahons, they always treated me nice and, 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 and fair. Uh, in 1988, I had a brain aneurysm in Boston, Massachusetts, the day before WrestleMania. Mm -hmm. And uh, Vince ran a head run cable TV for me to see WrestleMania, which I was out of it because I was in ICU for 17 days. And then when I went home, it took me about almost a year to get well, <clears throat> but he paid me in full. My check came every week, just like I was there. And I thought that was real nice of him. And uh, it was something that he really didn't have to do. But back then he did look out for his employees. I mean, he was really a good guy as far as taking care of his people. And I happened to be one of them that he took care of just about a year. Yeah. Let, let's talk about that first angle with you guys coming in as twins with Hulk and Andre. Lead us through. I know most of us have probably seen this angle and stuff, but it's going to be more interesting if you tell it and, and how, how it could develop to fruition. Well, the day it happened, the day of the show, uh, I came to the billing, came in, walked in, and everybody, you know, a few guys said, hi, hi. They thought I was David. And I went on right on to Vince's office and sat in his office the whole day. A little later, David came in, and they just thought it was a David. Only one David. They didn't know that it was two of us. Or if they did, they didn't realize that both of us were there. So at the time, of, when it came time to do the match, uh, David went to the ring. No, I went to the ring. And I'd done the match, and then when, as the match went on, David came out, and it was a, like, oh, my God, what's this? You know. Did you do anything leading up to that match? To, I mean, you guys are twins, but was there anything that you did to try to uh, really pull one over in, in terms of looking identical? I mean, the dress was similar, same. Did you do anything with your weight? Is it, yeah. You guys have some weight differences. Yeah, I, 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 have, I was trying to lose some weight, so I look almost like Earl. Mm -hmm. But e e even though, uh, you know, something that big going on, uh, people really aren't picking up, for, as far as I'm concerned, is the weight. Even though it is a difference, a little difference, mm -hmm. but it, it was just so used of the seeing the same face and the same ref usually doing the main events. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think that was a big factor. You know, I don't really know if it had been. I think a lot of people would have caught it, but not saying that nobody did. But it, it was very. If anybody caught it, it, was very few people. A lot of people thought it was was plastic surgery. You know, mm -hmm. and I'll tell you one thing. That was that. As far as I'm concerned, that's the hottest angle ever in the business, and that angle almost got us killed with the people because they hated us. They hated us. Were there any specific of Hulk interactions with the fans? Oh God, yeah. I mean, we had to have police protection. We had police cars take us to the airport. Police stay with us until we got on the plane. I mean, after that, it was terrible for a while. Terrible. How how long did that that last for you? About about three months. About three months was that hot? Yeah. Talk about working uh, for, you know, Vincent Mann, where everything was based on storylines compared to working for Crockett, which, you know, people remember Ricky Steamboat and uh, Ric Flair 60-minute battles. Different, the different perception of the crowd and, and, and your role as a ref in that. Well, I did the Ricky Steamboat and uh, Macho Man, and they had 22 false finishes in that match, and that was a uh, the WrestleMania. Yeah. 
that was a, a, a big match. And did you have any opportunities to, to referee the Flair Steamboat matches or did Tommy Young get? Some Tommy, I think Tommy Young got most of those because I wasn't that good at the time. Mm -hmm. I was just breaking in and uh, learning. And Dave, you were the referee assigned to the Hulk Hogan Ultimate Warrior match at WrestleMania 6. What was it uh, Donald Trump at Atlantic City? Yeah. No, no it was, was Toronto. Actually. It was me. Oh, that was you? Okay, How, what were some of the memories of that match? Well, so that, at that time, that was the. Uh, my, yes, the match might have been, but the build up to it was one of the biggest. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, it, it was good. I mean, uh, you know, just, you know, other than pointing at Michigan at the Dome, I guess that's one of the biggest houses that. Well, it is the biggest house that I've ever been in. So it was, it was, a, it was one heck of a feeling for me walking out there doing that match. Are you talking about the Hogan Andre now, or are you talking about Hogan? Hogan, Hogan and, uh, oh, uh, I'm talking about the Hogan and uh, Ultimate Warrior. Okay. Is that what you're talking about? Well, yeah, but you said the biggest house you'd ever been in, I thought maybe. You were oh, yeah, the biggest house, because I, working for Crockett, we didn't, we never had those big houses. Right. And when you worked Pontiac to Michigan, that was the first WrestleMania, I think. It was 70-some thousand. And I think, uh, I think it was 72,000 at the uh, Toronto. Oh, wow. I think. Now, I could be wrong. Who were some of the other referees uh, in the WWF at the time? Um, Sonny Fargo. WWF. Oh. Uh, Joey Morello. Me. And then there would be um, uh, Freddie Sparta. That was about it. And then they'd have a commission referee or something. You know. Do all the referees get along? Is there any stories there that... Uh, uh, <laughs> They all of them nitpick at something, or at each other about something. Uh, it's never uh, usually it's uh, it's always something to be said do in a match. Do you critique each other's work as a referee? What's that, Jen? Do you critique each other's work as a referee? Kind some, of. Some of the wrestlers, you know, will critique other wrestlers. So. Right, right, right. Well, the only thing I do, I don't, I don't really pick it. Uh, I didn't pick it anybody. I tried to make. I tried to make them understand what it means to be a ref and always try to help them. It was never I well, thought I was any better than any of them and still don't. But, uh, I mean, you know, it's just like anybody else. You can't last forever, so you got to give the young an opportunity and a chance. And the only way you're going to give it to them is put them in big matches and let them do the best they can do, even if it gets screwed up. At least they've been there. They have the pressure. It's off of them maybe next time or a little bit more the following time. And... I just want them to be, you know, while I was there, I just wanted to want them to be good and learn. It was my thing. I would. It, it was not like I was fighting for for posi position. Well, a lot of them do, but it's so stupid because we're all one group, mm -hmm. and you're going to learn to do this and that and the other. In time, you mix up what you've been doing and what you didn't get to do. You'll all come out equal, and hopefully, you know, you'll be a good ref. Talk about some of the, the pressure. Do you feel more pressure in a, in a really high-profile match as a referee than you do? An average match? No, not really. I feel more pressure in an underneath match. Why is, why is that? Well, because the, the the big matches, everybody knows basically, if been in business for a long time, and know what they're doing. There's some of the young guys in there, they don't know what they're doing, and some and sometimes they don't listen. Sometimes they end up hurting you or me or their opponent, you know. So it's like you're a tutor in underneath matches and you're a referee in the big matches. What are the, some of the things you can do as a, as a tutor in the ring with some of these guys that, you know, to help out and assist with the match? Just if something looks sloppy on TV, just tell them to go back and get it, do it again. You know? You'd say that during the match? You'd say mm -hmm. just do it again? Yeah. You went from an era where uh, there was probably no communication to the back and then you started going into with some earpieces. Right. Uh, how much information is passed along through those earpieces? Ba basically the time. Just the time. The time of the matches, yeah. And that was my idea. I came up with that idea. Was there ever a time when you heard something in the back and they, they wanted to change something just on the spot? No, not really. No. Most of it's already said and done. And, you know, like the Undertaker, Shawn Michaels, and all the top guys, you wouldn't dare mention, tell them what to do. Sure. Uh, you uh, actually helped Shane McMahon get it started as a referee. I, I, yeah, I, uh, I took time to show him 
how to slide and how to count and stuff like that. But he was pretty well under control anyway. He, you know, he just wanted little tips here and there. But he, but he, he knew what he was doing. Was there any uh, jealousy for maybe some of the the other referees that uh, Vincent Man's son? Was no. Again on your territory? Or? No, because I think uh, Mike Kyoto helped him, and uh, as well as uh, probably all of us helped him some. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't like it was just me. It was like oh, we all pitched in because everybody's got a different way of doing something. Sure. Nobody does the same thing every way. Every the same way. Nobody counts the same way. Nobody slides the same way. So everybody's got their own technique. I'm going to talk about a couple of uh, you know stories and rumors, and I'm just going to put them out there. And if you have some information on them or things you want to say about them, if you could just follow up. 1991, uh, there was the, the big ring ring boy scandal with uh, Pat Patterson involved. Were, were you? Uh, was there was there any information passed along to you in that time? Or no, not to me. Is it even ringing a bell? The oh, it's ringing a bell about all this stuff going on, but something I never cared about. I wasn't involved in nothing, so I never listened to nothing. And Never got involved in anything. Said in uh, 1992 that Sid was fired for uh, for uh, you catching him cheating on a drug test. Yep. Is that true? True. And he told me he's gonna kill me. He did. <laughs> yeah. Did you catch him like in the act cheating on the thing, or is mm -hmm. this? A, yeah. And at that, was that that point he threatened you? Yeah. You had already started working as a road agent at that point, or were you just mm -hmm. road agent? Yeah. Talk about some of the responsibilities as a road agent. I mean, obviously this would be one of them. Yeah, well, you know, we had the urine test. It was random. And, um, you know, I, I worked, me, Tony Guerrero, and Howard Finkel, us at TV would sit down and work all the TV, where we're going to fly into, where we're going to fly out of, uh, get the uh, meet and greets and stuff done, and then the kids that were dying or some kind of handicap problem, tumors and stuff. We take care of that, bring them backstage, give them uh, merchandise, and try to make them happy, you know. Mm -hmm. And any time where I went to any town, uh, uh, if someone would come and say, uh, <coughs> building manager would come and say, David, listen, we got a kid tonight, and we did, we call the office, and they said it's too late to do this, too late to do that. It ain't never too late. Mm -hmm. Once a kid, I mean, the kid may not even be there next time. I, n I always brought people backstage. I always took good care of them. Really, really good care of it. Now, how did you go into your role from, uh, as a referee to a road agent? Was it just an opportunity that came up and you said that's something you were interested in doing? Yeah, well, it came up and they wanted me to be one. So I went to be one and I didn't like it. So I went back and told Vince I'd like to go back to referee. He says, well, I really need you in that spot. I said, well, Vince, I don't like it. I don't like it. What did you like about it? It's just, I mean, it, you're, you're you're just terribly busy, you know, all the time, busy, busy, busy. And plus, I missed the ring, you know. Mm -hmm. The biggest thing was I missed the ring. You know, going out every night and get cold chills when the place is packed and <clears throat> you're doing a good match. And, you know, I like that. I like to be in the eye of the camera. Mm -hmm. But uh, he said, well, he said, I really need you here, and when, which he did, you know. I mean, I handled all the money, all the tickets. I handled everything. And... Um, did a good job for him for 24 years. Mm -hmm. And Earl, had you found the passion as a referee? You mentioned before you, you weren't too passionate about being a referee. What, at what point you know, did you grow to love doing this? Well, when I got an opportunity to do it full time, I really loved it. And the more I worked for Crockett back then, I started loving it more. And then after I got the chance to come up with WWF at the time, uh, I, you know, it fell right in and I loved it. But I lo also loved it because uh, it was a good company to work for, mm -hmm. you know. We had talked briefly when we left the subject about Sid failing his drug test. Uh, were, there, were there any other people that, I mean, you were in a position where you'd have to to report them cheating or failing? Or, I guess yeah. that was one of your roles as a road agent. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if I caught them, then they got turned into vets. Mm -hmm. I don't care how big Sid was, it didn't matter. You know, you got a job to do, you do it. So. Well, it must have been intimidating for me. Oh, it was. <laughs> How authentic were the, the drug tests? You know. uh, it would be somebody just about every week, maybe two people, three people. But it was random. And then when they would, they would have them sometimes with everybody taking them. So. 
w would there have been a way to, you know, and I don't want to talk too much, I know you, you still uh, respect Vince and, and he's treated you well, but the, the drug testing policy in wrestling, like other sports, there's always ways around it. How tight would you say the drug testing policy was, uh, when you, at least when you were overseeing part of it? Well, when, when we had to oversee it, we were standing right there, you know. So there's no way they could have got around it, you know. But, what, what if Sid scheduled for a, a main event match in the next pay-per-view? I mean, was there any, like, we're not going to test him this, at this point? Because there must have been rampant nope. use of steroids during that time. If he was in a, if he was in a pay-per-view for the next month and they already announced it, then he would go ahead and do it. But Vince would find him and then suspend him after that. Because then if you do that, then you're letting all your fans oh, down. Sure. You, you, you promise them the match, and they're sitting home waiting, and all of a sudden Sid Justice won't be here. You know, right. you, you're hurting the people. Mm -hmm. Did uh, either of you re referee the Hogan-Sid match at WrestleMania 8 where uh, Sid double-crossed Hogan and, and, and kicked out of his leg drop? Who did I do? Who, uh, I don't think I did that match, did I? I think I done it. Do you remember? Do you remember any specifics about it? I oh, did. I do. I don't know. I can't remember. What year was that? Uh, I think it was WrestleMania eight. Could have been Joy Moreau. Uh, I can't remember when Joy died. Could have been Joy. It was either me or. Uh, well, I, I guess the fair question. Do you do you have any mem memories of because you were there at the time of, of uh, Sid kicking out of that? Messing up the ending to the main event. I don't remember. I can't, truthfully, I I can't remember. If I if I knew, I would honestly tell you, but I can't remember. We're speaking more generally. Were there any matches that you remember where the the finish didn't go as planned? You know, one guy might have double crossed the other in, on the finish. No, other than the. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll Bret Hart and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about whatever that, <laughs> that one. Uh, it was also rumored that you, when when Ric Flair came from WCW to WWE, that you were actually put on the road with him to make sure he was able to to make all his uh, scheduled appearances. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's not so much Rick not making the shows; it's getting in there on time. That was the issue. It wasn't that Rick Rick Holly ever missed any any shows. It's just getting him out on time and make sure he's going to bed at night. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's all. How, how long did you uh, basically travel with Rick and make sure he was able to do that? Maybe three or four months. Till I was bed dead myself. <laughs> Till you what? Till I was about to die myself. About to die? Did he run you pretty hard? Can't, I, couldn't, I can't keep the nightlife he's got. Really? Yeah. And was that pretty much part of your role? As they said, if he's out at night, we need you there with him? Just, just keep him under control. Try to. There's nothing wrong with Rick. He's a great guy. He's just he just likes to have a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of fun together. But you know, as just said, I just couldn't keep up with the with well, the what, pace. What would a night out with Rick involve? Going out to the bar, drinking, just dancing, getting, dancing, coming in at three, four in the morning, catching the plane at six or seven. Did they pay you any additional amount for I guess that supervision? He took, yeah, Vince took care of me. Yeah. And what ultimately led you to stop following around? Was it just... You just Couldn't take it no more. Yeah. Just killing myself. Right. I just couldn't handle it. It's too much for me. Is there any other stories about uh, doing that with Rick that you can share with us? That well, when he worked for... Uh, this is way, way, way back. Mm -hmm. We had a... Uh, well, it may have been American Bash in Chicago. And I was... And they, I worked at American Bash, and I went out with him down on uh, was a big street called downtown. Was where all the stuff is like something like Bourbon Street. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I went down there with him, and everybody went, and we drank and we drank. And it was a hotel up there. What was that hotel called, David? Where everybody used to stay in? Since Chicago. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, it was an old hotel. Oh, I know what I can't think of the name. Of it. Anyway. I was, as soon as the show was over, uh, we were supposed to fly home the next day. I got home like two days later <laughs> from just partying for Rick. I mean, he set the whole deal up. You know, that's one good th one thought I can remember about Rick. 
But he's a great guy. Mm-hmm. Well, you, you knew we would we would talk about this. One of one of the subjects that we were most interested in hearing is your perspective on the, the Bret Hart uh, Shawn Michaels match mm-hmm. from uh, Survivor Series '97. Uh, I mean, you, you know, I guess what the question is is I, I guess I'll just turn it over to you, and then I'll, I'll ask some follow-ups. Well, uh, first of all, Vince screwed Brett. I was in there. I was just a part of it. But And again, maybe the way it happened, everybody feels like I did it. But uh, uh, once uh, Sean got him in, Brett in, his, in the sharpshooter, it was over. Whether I was did ring the bell or didn't ring the bell, the bell was going to ring. Uh, at what point uh, were you basically involved in, in the match? Did they tell you that this is what you need to do? The day of the show, were you it was ten minutes before the match, if that. I'll say ten minutes. That's. And, and who said what to you ten minutes before the match? Uh, Jerry Briscoe told me what to do. And what did he say to you? He said when Vince, when Sean puts Brett in the sharpshooter, I want you to wait a few seconds and ring the bell. Uh, you must have immediately had some sort of reservations being a, a friend of Brett's. And I'm going. I can't do it. So what do you mean you can't do it? I said, I can't do it. I said, I promised him I wouldn't cheat. I wouldn't count him out. Did, and Brett came to you before this and, and said, please? Well, we, we were flying on an airplane the night before the show. Mm-hmm. And he said, you won't count me out, will you? I said, nope, just keep your shoulders up. I said, as long as your shoulders are moving, I will not count you out. Now, being in a sharpshooter in a submission is not a count out. Yeah, but you, you even said that you didn't know. When you said that to, Br- with, to Brett on the plane, you must have thought with all the... Uh, you couldn't have expected this to happen. Well, you did. I, I didn't expect any of this to happen. I really didn't. I think Brett thought that I would cheat him by counting one, two, three. Mm-hmm. And, and I had no idea this was ever going to happen until, like I said, 10 minutes, and that's, ex- that's stretching it, is when I was getting ready to go to the ring. Mm-hmm. So... Dave, what kind of uh, knowledge did you have? Uh, I was downstairs. I had the car ready to go. Well, so we can get out of there. Actually, I'd gotten to Dave and told him this is what I've got. This is what I'm, I'm going to do. So, for the first time, to- first time you knew about the finish of the match was when your brother told you. Mm-hmm. And what was your first reaction? Holy Christ! I said, "Man, this ain't happening, is it?" And it did. But you know, uh, as as I as as I look at it now, and probably uh, a week later after it happened, at all the people working there, Brett was screwing each and every, each and every one of them, including myself. It's not so much a Vince McMahon. It's the talent, all the guys that put him over and made him what he is or was, he's cheating them and they helped him. And that's how I felt about it. As time went on, I mean, I had a choice to or not to. And the bell was going to ring regardless. But as I stepped in the ring and I'm coming, passing everybody going to the ring, I'm stopping and thinking, you know, there's there's, there's guys back there, there's Undertaker, there's uh, uh, all our top stars. That even put him over, mm-hmm. you know, and you know, here's a guy that doesn't care about just say if it was an 80 ass or 180. He didn't. He didn't care. I mean, he already had his deal made down at WCW, so he was signed, sealed. And all he had to do was be delivered. So what did he have to lose? Nothing. Basically, what did he want to do? Like Lander Blaze, take the damn belt down there and throw it in the trash can, or hold it up like ha ha ha. And, and, and it, for the embarrassment of all the, our guys, including myself. So I gave things, during the match, I was doing a lot of thinking. And that was the one biggest thought on my mind. And as the more I thought about this, that, and the other, and I think about all the guys in the back, I go, well, you know, maybe maybe this is the right thing for me to do. So it was actually in the match itself when you finally made the decision that you would go along? I didn't know for sure what I was going to do, and nobody else did except me. I didn't even know except doing the match. <clears throat> I had no idea what I was going to do. <clears throat> I know what they wanted me to do. But 
I don't even think they were sure because the way I left them, I wasn't sure. Brett, in some sub subsequent interviews, had said that he personally chose you to be the referee in that match because he trusted you like no other referee. Right. Uh, was there any point from uh, when Briscoe gave you the finish to when you went out there, or even while you were out there, that you thought maybe you should let Brett know, or, or was it something you just kept inside? Well, I didn't have time to let Brett know. And... I, I, I'm, if I'd have had time, I'm sure, I'm, I'm not sure if I would have. You know, that point I can't answer, but I knew as I was going to the ring and thinking, oh my God, what am I going to do? And then you're thinking about myself, I'm thinking about Brett, I'm thinking about all the other people in the back. But the other people in the back didn't really rush in my mind and until I got in the ring and I'm then I'm thinking because I think uh, I just I can't put my finger on it now I think somebody else had a hard time dropping a strap one time but I can't maybe if you guys know you can tell me and I can bring it back up but for somebody just to be selfish and not do what they're supposed to do to make other people suffer Especially when you got like roughly somewhere in the neighborhood of three million dollars waiting for you. Mm -hmm. What are you worried about? What's the difference to make? When you could have dropped it way before you got in your own country, right. and you had ample time to do it in a nice way, and you didn't want to do it, so you kept bucking it and bucking it and bucking it. What difference does it make? Hell, three million dollars. I'll, I'll give it. I'll give every wrestling shirt away. Anything they want. Mm -hmm. So. You know, why are you going to let all your other fellows suffer when they helped you get where you are? Describe, uh, you said that you had the car ready to go. Uh, you called for the finish and you sprinted out there. Well, I, uh, what were some, some of the things that you could have heard or felt on your way back to the locker room? Of me getting... Have you, had you ever had any heat like that before or even since? No. At the time when I rung the bell and I left the ring, if I had heat, I didn't know it because I didn't wait around for it. Mm -hmm. And now I did have it, and still do have it. Uh, it's been maybe 10, 12 years of whatever, maybe. Still have some heat, but uh, I wasn't going to be there because I knew once I did, once I had, once I had done what I did, uh, McMahon got the hell beat out of him. The TV monitors got smashed, and I knew it was going to be bad. I knew it was going to be trouble. And I didn't want to be part of it. I'll be smashed up. But then again, if you stop and look back, maybe if I had been smashed, I'd have gotten some of that $3 million. <laughs> so, what the hell? And uh, describe driving out of the arena. Do you remember any of the conversation that you had? Yeah, I was just, I was in such a hurry just to get out of there. Because with it being the last match, I figured the fans would get around to the back. Me and Earl trying to get out, they would have probably turned the call over. I mean, we could have really seriously got killed that night. Uh, and, and did you have any interactions with fans? You probably went straight back to the hotel, mm -hmm. I'm guessing. Did you have any interactions with the fans at the hotel or maybe from the hotel to the no. airport? Maybe well, you know, the next day I figured we were flying out of Montreal, and I said, oh, this is going to be rough, you know. But nobody really said a whole lot, you know. So it probably wasn't really a whole, whole lot of marks at the airport, you know. And we left early. We left on like a 5.30 flight just to get out of there. Probably they were still in shock. Right. You must have had a couple of wrestlers talk to you about this incident. Uh, maybe guys like Undertaker and, uh, and some of the other guys that had done for Brett what, what he didn't want to do for Shawn Michaels. Uh, what's generally the feeling you get and the feedback you get from, from the wrestlers? Well, speaking of Undertaker, he's the very first person I talked to. And... He told me that, don't feel bad what I did. I done the right thing. And which was like, he actually said, you supported all the boys. And all the boys have support for you. And the meeting I had with Vince was, how in the hell can anybody ever trust me again? But it's, this business is not trust anymore. There's no trust whatsoever. There's no guarantee. 
I can tell you that now. So my philosophy in this business from here on, whether it's with WWE or whoever or whatever, I'm going out if, and do my job, and that's it. All I need to do in reward for what I do is be paid. Mm -hmm. I have no loyalty for nobody no more. Just, and we'll, well, I'll, I'll come back to that, that thought here in a little bit. But wh what is your opinion? Do you think Shawn Michaels knew it at all, uh, the finish that was playing in that? Sure finish? he did. What, what, what makes you uh, say that with a good instinct? Because if I went in and knew it, and Vince McMahon knew it, there's got to be somebody else that knew it. That's my feelings. Mm -hmm. uh, do you fault Vincent Mann at all for uh, turning that incident into an angle that put Vincent Mann to be the, the top villain in, in his own company and, and really stretch out that incident into a, an extended angle? No. Do you think it was the right thing for him to do? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 I will say that. Yep. I mean, did you look at all these companies, Eon, they got bankrupt for their CEOs. Do you think they did their people right? The people that are looking for their Social Security or retirement money? And we're in a business where Vince is taking care of his business and taking care of his help or talent, employees at that time. Now I don't blame him, Vince at all. Did you have any subsequent conversations with Bret Hart following, following this incident? Uh, no, it was probably after he left and went with w WCW. So I'm in an airport in Charlotte. And I uh, walked over and uh, said, uh, Brett, can we talk for a second? He goes, well, you screwed me. That's using a light word. Right. And I said, well, if that's where you feel, it's no me. We wasted my time talking to you because I'm not going to sit here and explain something to you. I try to. If that's the thought of, thought you have on your mind, I'm wasting my time, so the hell with it. So I walked off. Then uh, as time went on, I think uh, it was in it was in Calgary, Calgary. He came down to one of our shows and he walked up to me and he goes, "I just want to let you know, I know it wasn't your fault." He said, "I know what the story is." Was I said, "Well, thank you. I've been trying to tell you that for years." But you wouldn't let me come across. You wouldn't let me get it across to you. I said, but I appreciate that. And that was the end of it. Were you friends with Shawn Michaels before this incident? I, I guess. Were you as good a friend with Shawn Michaels as you were with Brett both? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and have you guys ever talked about the incident? No. Since then? No. We haven't. Uh, no. We haven't said anything about it to each other at all. And. Uh, Every time you go back to Canada, do you hear at least somebody? Oh, well, uh, I guess it's been maybe six months or more they took me off the Canada tours because doing the TVs, it would be more howling of you screwed Brett than it would be the matches, and I was messing up the TVs and, and whatever, so they just took me off and left me at home. Uh, another thing, it's just a, a rumor that I heard that you might – you might have done uh, the DX crotch chop in Canada oh, yeah. after in response to that. Oh yeah. Was was that just your own idea? Just well, some of yeah. That, uh, everything I done in Canada, or whatever it was, was my idea. It was because either at the time I was pissed and was sick of this shit, or basically that was it. Or somebody would throw something, a hit, uh, hit, spit. I go into the ring, I'd be spit on, beer thrown, everything, you know. Was there any directives that, you know, maybe let's stop this, don't do that? Or, or, or did, they, they, did nobody give you any directions in terms of how to deal with it? Oh, they, yeah, they told me to quit milking it. Yeah. Just leave it, let them go, don't, don't uh, buy into it. So I did, you know. But I never, I really never seriously hurt anybody. It was either by words or something mm -hmm. to get even. But after a while, it got so old, it didn't matter anymore. And actually, as the time went on, it felt good that I could still carry the heat mm -hmm. and as a ref. 
a lot of angles never carry that much heat. Sure. So hell, I'm just a ref. I'm carrying more heat. Actually, I've carried more heat than some of the guys can get. It's true. So that means I'm doing a good job. And my thoughts, as long as I can carry heat, piss the crowd off, I'm doing my job. If I make them all happy, they're not going to come back. They always want to come see somebody either hurt me or kill me. So as long as I leave them pissed, they'll come back and hope that I do get killed or hurt. Uh, Dave, were you ever in a position uh, where you, you might have had to deceive a wrestler in order to accomplish uh, a goal or a directive that was given to you? You know what? All my years of refereeing, my, mine were fine. I never had uh, anybody say they won't go do this, they won't go do that, or they put me in a position to do this. It, it, it never happened. So. And, and the heat that your brother carried as a result of being in uh, that match with Bret Hart being twins, has anyone ever confused uh, you for him? Well, now that when, before we were let go, uh, when he didn't go to Canada, and they, I went to Canada, they said, they said, you screwed Brad, you screwed Brad. So they should have just brought him on to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> and even though uh, Brian, now when Brian goes, they tell you, they start hollering, your daddy screwed Brett. Mm -hmm. So it's the thing that probably won't ever, yeah, something yeah. probably live on forever over there. On another hill. Mm -hmm. Near Spawn or what, on another hill. I'm going to talk about a, an incident that happened in uh, 2000 when uh, you cost Triple H the world title and uh, he, he punched you and put you out for two months. What, what were the circumstances that? Uh, did you just want some time off, or was was that uh, was that when uh, two thousand? Who was he working with? With the Rock. Uh, they brought you back a few months later to be uh, the replacement ref for Shane McMahon during the, the Triple H Rock rematch. I think it was just an angle. But you were off TV for for two months. Right. So what do you do with two months? No, no, off? wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, I think I was having my knee scoped. Oh, I can yeah. think of it. The tore my knee. The biggest one was my shoulder. That was ten weeks, so I guess it was my knee that needed it. Any time I've ever been off. It wasn't because I wanted off, because I was hurt and had to be off. Mm -hmm. I've been beat up so damn much that it's unreal. So Both of you, talk about some of the injuries that you sustained as a ref, because a lot of people don't realize that you're right there in the middle of the Well, my first, my first night with it, when it was WWF, when Hogan launched me out, they missed me, hit the floor, tore all the meat off the rotor cup here. Actually, they took a half inch of our bone off, out, so that it can move, because I hit the floor instead of being caught. Uh, DBIC threw his briefcase in because he was late getting there. Hits me in the back of the head, messes his nerve up in my eye. One of my eyes doesn't dilate anymore. Uh, my legs have been torn apart. I've had about four operations on each knee. Uh, I did take a bad bump from, uh, I can't remember, Sean, I think, or. or uh, no, it wouldn't shine. Somebody else. Uh, anyway, I took a bump through the rope, and it hit the floor so hard that I, th I thought I was paralyzed. Couldn't move my legs and stuff, arms. But it was just a stinger. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was lucky. Uh, Piper whacked me in the top of the head with a damn chair one night. Out of the blue, I split that open. Take her... Sean swung a chair, hit me across the eye, bust that open. Uh, my elbows have been splintered on the steps, being hit. Uh, one of the worst things is my left shoulder. It's got a big scar on it, but Triple H hit me with a sledgehammer. Mm -hmm. It took 10 weeks to be healed. But it was, when I did get injured, I kept going and injured it more. So if I had actually went and got it fixed when it first happened, been a lot better off. But the more I worked, the more bumps I took, the worse it got. Went down to Birmingham. Dr. Andrews fixed me up. Came back home, stayed home uh, 10 weeks. Then went back. Worked two weeks. Randy hits the ropes and hits it, runs into his leg. I'm back getting surgery again. So that's when I decided uh, 
this year, uh, at, if I'd have lasted that long, WrestleMania would have been the last one. I could have quit on my own instead of getting fired, which is bullshit, but anyway. Dave, do you have any war stories with the injuries? Yep, I've had a replacement here. They broke broke my bone in here. I uh, from from what specifically? Th throwing out of the ring. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Yoko landed on my nose one night, and I had to. They cut my nose here and pulled it back, put a bone in here because I was getting so well I couldn't breathe. You know. And then I had to get that camera over here. <laughs> then I has a knee replacement right here, all the way here. Just blast it. All those years referee and taking those bumps, landing on your knees. And back when I was refereeing, you know, they didn't, they didn't, all the guys didn't have knee pads and stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, my body took a beat. And uh, all these injuries, is, did Vince take care of all the costs? Oh, yeah. Vince is very good at taking care of us. I can't never say he never take care of us. He's yeah. always been good. If that would have happened uh, while working for Crockett, what, what do you think? The You'd have been at home paying your own bills right. and nothing would have been sent to you. Not even a get well card. Uh, one I'd like to talk about is the night that Owen Hart passed away. You got, were both of you guys at the building that night? Yeah, I was. I was right at the ring, just as just as it happened. Well, can you can you describe for us? I mean, you know, we all know about what happened, but in your own words. Well, I, you know, when I got to the ring, Owen was dead. I mean, he that rope had cut his arm all the way around. I mean, I, it was just a piece of skin holding it. And, uh, I mean, he, he wouldn't even bleed. His arm wouldn't even bleed. And then Tony Grill was up there with me. And uh, we, we knew Owen was dead. We knew he was dead. I mean, he had that, the mask on, his eyes were just like that. I mean, he was gone. So, you think it'd be fair to say there's nothing they could have done to save him? Nothing. I think uh, I, I didn't see this, but because I was in the back, but from falling out through the ceiling, hitting all those bar joists, and then finally hitting the ring, which I think uh, th he tore the main artery out of his heart when he hit the ropes. So that right there was probably the, but that was probably the last straw. But I kind of think Owen was dead coming down after hitting all that stuff in the ceiling. Mm -hmm. Had he ever, were you ever in a position to hear his reservations about coming out of the ceiling? Because there were other wrestlers and uh, family members that, that mentioned he, he didn't feel comfortable doing it. No, I never, I n no, I, I, I never heard anything. Only I was just, I just looked up and after the night was over and looked up and figured, well, you know, coming through that probably would be dead before you ever got down to the bottom. But I'm not a doctor, I don't know. So I just looked up and looked and just had my own thoughts. But uh, it was horrible. Horrible. Has WWF ever put you in a position uh, where they asked you to do something that you felt uncomfortable doing in terms of maybe taking a bump? seen subsequent things, people going into trash cans and falling off stages, and uh, a lot of people don't realize the risk that is involved in these moves. Were you ever asked to do anything that you felt was outside your comfort level? I don't, anything I've ever been asked to do, if I didn't want to do it, I didn't have to do it. Vince is really, not only, I'm just speaking to myself right now, but he's never pressured me to do anything or take any kind of bumps that I didn't feel, un feel safe with. And he also said, I would never ask you to do something that I wouldn't do myself. But I've never, as long as I've been around there, I've never seen him pressure anybody. This, this me being around at the times when things are going on, I never heard him once say, if you don't do this, I'm gonna fire you. If you don't do that, I'm gonna fire you. He's never in his life. I've never seen him put pressure on anybody to do anything he doesn't want to do. I the, reason, the reason I was asking this question is I was imagining there must be a, a level of trust you know, it's a big company, and they certainly must take all the precautions that, that you would think would be taken. Uh, if you were asked, maybe, maybe this is an extreme case to, to fall from the ceiling or something, would you have enough trust in Vince McMahon and the management there to know that they, they took all the precautions and they were not putting you in it? 
I would have all the precautions, but I wouldn't do it because I'd be too scared. I would end up hurting myself, whether it was safe as sound. By me being scared, I would probably hurt myself, even though nothing would have happened. I'd have done something probably to hurt myself because they do take extra precautions for anything that we do. And some of them will do things that they don't have to do. Look at Nick Foley. It's brutal, you know? And I've seen him scream and holler, tell him, don't do this, don't do that. Dump 10 million thumbtacks in a damn ring, and I got to count three. Uh, just things that he'd done, he shouldn't have, you know, I wouldn't have done. And Vince never asked him to do a lot of those things. He'd done them on his own. And that's how a lot of people get hurt by doing things on their own. I want to push that level to see how far they can go, and that's when you get hurt. Dave, did you follow uh, Owen's body to the back? Because you said you, you, you came. Uh, yeah, morning, so. yeah, yeah. They had that uh, that hot thing uh, pumping. That was a good. And, and you didn't see uh, from your vantage point that he was responding at all to that? No. 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 Uh, do you know if there was any decision making process that you were witness to of uh, whether to continue the show or not? Um, I think the deal was that uh, they said, you know, if if Owen was here, he would still want the show to go on. Do you, it wasn't. No, Owen, do you, do you think that's what he would have wanted? Mm -hmm. yeah. I they, do. There's, you know, and there's different people, and Owen was one of the best. I mean, he loved his family. Uh, every night, at the end of the night, uh, if he could get a flight out, I mean, he'd go straight from the ring to the car, leave his grass and gear on to get on that plane and go home. He was a good family man. I mean, a good family man. And he, they, him and his wife just built a brand new house that, they, that he never got to move into because he got killed. And Owen was just very ready to retire. He was ready to retire? Yeah, about two more years he was finished. I will say this. Owen was the heart of the hearts. Mm -hmm. He was different from all of them. I mean, he was a class, classic guy. Uh, if you had a bad day, he'd, he'd have you laughing before the night was over. He was just a special person. He, he, had, he was totally different from the rest of the hearts. And he, like I said, you could come in and you could have the worst day of your life. For the next three hours or two and a half hours, how long that show last, he had you laughing back to normal. And he was great. The rest of them, so so. Was, was there anybody that you saw that had reservations about continuing the show? Any of the performers, any of the wrestlers, you, you personally? No. no. I was standing there, but they said that Owen would probably want the show to go on, which I really believe that. So you think during the show that it was the majority of the opinion that, that he had already passed away? Because I don't think it was announced to you guys until after the show. I, I, I didn't. I still think, he, regardless if he whether he would have lived or bless his heart, he died. But I think if he'd have been living, he'd have still said, go with the show. And I'm pretty sure most of them there, if they could have spoken in being in the position that Owen was in, they would have said, go, man, go with it. I mean, yeah. what about the weight or the burden of finishing up that show, knowing what just happened? It was heartbreaking, and it was tough for everybody back in the back. Did you everybody feel like you wanted to get? Did you feel, ever feel like let me just get this show over with? Yeah, I was. Yeah, I did want to get it over with and want to get out of the building. And we did film TV the next day, and then we all went home. What was it like the next day after everybody? Mighty quiet. Mighty quiet. And probably the show was the shits, because nobody had to get up and go energy. It's just that everything was there. We were there. And just moving. And just know. moving. And it was good that we did do it because I think it, by just being there, going through the motions, it helped everybody f to a certain extent. But after that, it was time to go home, and which Vince canceled all the shows after that, and we stayed home about a week, which gave us all a good time just to rest up and get our thoughts straight because it was, you know, still today is a lot of people hurt, mm -hmm. you know. And I'm not asking you to criticize Vince in any way, but, uh, you know, because you, you're put on the spot to make these, these calls and, and hindsight's 20-20, but is there, is there anything that could have been done differently uh, that, that would have 
looking back on it, you would have said, I wish we would have done it this way, handled it in this fashion. No. Whether it be the finishing the show or following through on Monday or starting up when you did, was everything handled, would you would you consider perfectly? Yeah. I'm glad we did the show. I'm glad we uh, kept it going uh, because everybody would have been totally, they were already, we were already mixed up when it happened or messed up. So by just staying there and doing what we did, I think it helped us all because once you leave there and all that thought's on you to drive in a car right away, boom, or whatever you do. You know, half of them probably would have went out and got drunk in a bar and maybe could have gotten killed in a car right. So by staying there, relieving some of that stress, I think it helped everybody. And I think it was the right call. And I really think the next day, having TV, uh, walking out, everybody on that ramp, Aaron, Aaron, I mean, uh, was great. You see, and another thing too, when Aaron was buried, Vince paid for everything. And any boys that wanted to go up there, he flew them up there. And plus he flew the wives if they wanted to go for, for nothing. So, I mean, Vince, Vince is a good man. I mean, they shut the highways up down there. Vince had rented them, I don't know how many limousines for the family, food, I mean, everything. Everything. Hotels, he took care of everybody that wanted to go to the funeral, which most everybody went. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, there's really no good segue following that topic, but I, I do want to talk about Earl, you, uh, when WCW was purchased by Vince and they brought Nick Patrick in, you actually had an opportunity to be arrested. Yeah. Des describe uh, how much notice you had that that, that, that was their intentions to, to have a match with you, Nick Patrick. Well, at the time, we were just having little spit spats back and forth with uh, our refs and the WCW refs, Charles Robinson, Nick, and uh, uh, Billy Silverman or somebody like that. I think it was him. And, uh, you know, it was, I thought it was just a little thing just adding up to just showing this, that, and the other, just a part of the program. So then when it ended up, I was going to wrestle Nick uh, at, where was it? I know it was in... Uh, Cleveland, Ohio. If I can't remember, was it was it SummerSlam or? Invasion. Yeah, the WWF invasion. Invasion. Okay. But it was good. I mean, it was fun. We shit, we knew what was going on. It's just that neither one of them wrestlers. Mm -hmm. And but it was a lot of fun. I'm glad I went over. <laughs> but as sitting here today, it don't matter whether I went over or not. I'm s but nah. But it was a lot of fun. Nick Patrick's a hell of a guy. He's a he's a hell of a referee, Ted. How much uh, direction was it? Because you, being a referee, I'm sure you know a lot to do with around the ring. But I guess you've not been in the ring as a wrestler before that in quite some time. Or yep. ever for you, in your case, right? right. Uh, was there any any of the wrestlers step up and say, "Here's what you should do," or was the was the match plan, you know, every detail of it? Uh, it was. A, we got some help from uh, Triple H on throwing punches and stuff, you know. But, you know, you, you, as, as many years I've been in the ring, it's it's hard to do. I mean, if you don't do it every day with the throwing a punch here, throwing a punch there, or dropping an elbow or a knee or whatever it be. And it's not as easy as, even though I've been there as long as I have, it's not that easy. So anybody on the street thinks they can just do it, 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 it doesn't work that way, you know. And, hell, Nick and I potatoed each other, you know, and we're friends. and we, Neither one of us wanted to get hurt. So, but uh, it worked out good. Uh, did I had you, a lot of fun. Did you jealous that you didn't get a, such a cool spot like that to get to work a match? Well, if Nick hadn't put him over, I was going to run in, so didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> that was a plan, huh? Good, bad you know, it would have been good if David could have been a referee. Mm -hmm. well, I want to talk about the, uh, the time. We've already mentioned uh, the injury before, earlier in the interview. But Triple H uh, hit you with an elbow drop, and you ended up having to have surgery. Shoulder surgery. Right. Uh, was that just a freak? That, freak yeah, that, that was a freak deal. Yeah. That was one of the things that just landed wrong. Because I'll tell you what, as many matches I've been in with Triple H, as many bumps as I've taken from him, I've always trusted him. There's certain people in that, I can name certain people that I do trust and don't trust. And Triple H is one that could bump me every night. And I've, Undertaker. 
Kurt Angle, uh, Hogan, I think way back, uh, were great guys, but knew, knew how to work. This question goes out to both of you. Is there anybody that you wouldn't trust? And that you'd be Vader. Vader? Yeah. Vader, Big <laughs> Show. Um, oh, I can't think of his name. The big Show, just because he's so big. He oh, Big Show broke my ribs. I run in, you know, goozle, boom, throws me down, bro broke my ribs, give Tony Guerrero a concussion, and uh, broke Sergeant Slaughter's ribs. And he said, we didn't know how to take the bump. He just eliminated three guys. Mm -hmm. I want to throw out a couple of names, just because we haven't touched on some of these names, just if there's any stories or, or, or thoughts or ribs that come to mind. Uh, you alluded to Hogan, but talk about working with Hulk Hogan. It was great. Working with Hogan was no pressure at all. I mean, once I worked with him and learned <coughs> the way he was going and how he was doing it, it was a piece of cake. Once you're around these guys and you work with them a long period of time, you can almost read them. You know, they don't even have, you know, it's easy. And Hogan was a lot of fun. Hogan says, we're here for uh, a short time. We're not here for a long time, but a good time. That was one of the words he always said. If you look at Hogan, you know, he didn't do all the things that everybody else does. And a lot of times, they don't have to do it. If they'd have watched Hogan work like Hogan, hell, they'd have been great, body-wise. But, you know, a lot of people bring, bring their own wounds to themselves. That Randy Savage. You know, I, I did a lot of Randy's matches before Earl came there. And Randy, you know, Randy is a real particular guy and he wants it right. He really wants it right. And everything, if it's not right, he really gets upset. But uh, I used to drive Randy and Liz around when they were at uh, WWF, WWE then. And uh, but Randy, Randy is definitely a businessman. Definitely a businessman. He wants to have a good match. He really does. And I, Grant him for that. Every match I ever did with him, I had a good time. So. But Andre the Giant. Andre was great. Yeah. I love working with Andre. I never forget one night. I can't remember the match. But uh, something was going on where Andre grabbed me to hold me. He grabbed me right across my head, right here. When he let go, the next day I got up. I had two black eyes. <laughs> and that's from the pressure. Not he was just a strong individual. He wouldn't hurt a flea. I mean, he was, he was a great guy. It's just that was one of the guys that ha had the strongest hands I've ever seen in my life. And probably the only guy that's been as, as nobody else could be as strong as he is. But he didn't mean to. He was so strong he didn't know his own strength. And it was just funny that the night he grabbed me, boom, he comes in the next day and my eyes are black. He said, what happened to you, boss? I go, you did it to me. He goes, no. I said, yes. I'm sorry. But he was like that. He was just great. I mean, he was super. Ultimate Warrior. Ultimate Warrior was the biggest nut I've ever seen in my life. Dangerous man. If you if you work with him, you better have a good insurance policy. In Toronto, Huck and the Warrior, a Hogan and the Warrior, hit me so hard that I didn't even know where I was when I took a clothesline and I laid there and I, I was I could feel blood or whatever it is in your head just circulate like a washing machine. I didn't know where I was. I didn't I couldn't even get up for. I don't, God knows, I don't know how long. The hardest, it's one of the hardest hits I've ever had in my, my life. And he's one guy that didn't really care about taking care of you. No. He would knock your damn head off. And not it only, didn't matter to him. Not only you, he could care less about the fans. He missed some towns. Events went on the TV. He buried him. Indianapolis, where he lived. He said the reason he's not here is because he lives here and he don't want to see you people. Mm -hmm. Because he was missing towns, mm -hmm. from Chicago to Milwaukee, he get, wouldn't make those towns. Because sometimes we used to do double shots on sa on, on Saturdays and Sundays, you know. And he just got way out of control. Is there anybody that you'd characterize as, as difficult as a uh, warrior? Mm, no, he's about the only one. Uh, just a couple more modern names about the Rock. Love, I love the Rock. Well, me too. Had a good time with the Rock. Rock and I were tag team partners in my own hometown, in Richmond. Oh, yeah? yeah. 
but uh, I had a lot of fun with the Rock. I think the Rock was a great. When he first came in, he had the right attitude. He had, he had what it he built up to what it had to take to be the, what he is. And he didn't snowball. He he worked himself up there. Plenty of them there have been here before the Rock got here, and they don't want it. They didn't want it. If they did, they didn't work for it. And I don't think money changed him at all. Just made him richer. But he's the same person he was before he even started making money. He's one guy that's the same guy. Well, one more name I'm going to ask you about is Steve Austin. Austin? It's my drinking buddy. Oh, yeah? We drank a lot of beer in the ring together. We had a lot of good times. And I, I uh, you know, they brought Austin in as a, uh, what was he, master something. I can't remember. A yeah, ringmaster. A ringmaster. And that wasn't him. And as time went on, you know, he came out with Stone Cold Steve Austin. And that he's a great guy. I, I tell you what, uh, he's had a lot of rough things happen to him in his life. One was his neck getting broke, the other down WCW when he tore his arm or something, said he never could use him again. But uh, as far as my, re my relationship with him and time spent with him in the ring, I work with him 365 days a year and never get hurt and have fun and drink beer. We drank some beer. I've, I've been in there in the corner when he kept throwing them. I'm going, damn, Austin, I can't drink no more. I'll come on and drink. So that's the way it was. But it was, it was a lot of fun with him. Is it more fun when a wrestler will get, get a referee involved in the match? Yes. And, and who does the best job of that? Well, I did a good job with Austin. I did a good job with Triple H. Did a hell of a job with Flair. Flair gets you involved whether you want whether you want to be or not. He's got something to always up his sleeve to get a referee. But it's it's good. I mean, and and uh, I think a lot of these other refs are enjoying it too. I mean, I've done just about everything that can be done. I've done it all, and I have no regrets. And it's I'm glad to see some of the other guys get the opportunity to do the same thing I've I've done. Not that they're going to be as good, but they're a good opportunity. Were either one of you on the uh, what's known as the flight from hell coming back from overseas? From Russia, when the plane almost crashed. Is that what you're talking about? From Russia. It was England. From England? Mm -hmm. It was where uh, Kurt and uh, Brock were wrestling in the aisle. Oh, I was on that. You were on that? Yeah, when they hit the emergency door. Yeah. Back in the back. Well, let's back up. Tell, just tell, because we've heard so many different versions from well, so many people that were on it. What, what did you see? You know what? In all honesty, when it was all over with, I didn't see anything, I just heard it. Because I was either so far back or up front playing cards and, and stuff that I never actually heard it. I, I, I'm like you guys, I heard about it from everybody else on the plane just like when you asked me. I never saw one thing or heard anything. But I know it was something going on back there. Was it, was it different than uh, I guess what a normal trip would be with the boys all on a plane? Oh yeah. 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 So the you don't think that the stories that came out of that was overhyped? It was, it was really that crazy? Oh, it was crazy. I mean, I didn't see it. I, I can just tell you uh, from, from whatever was said and done, it was done. I uh, want to address some of the, uh, the rumors. You know, uh, Earl, that in uh, July, uh, it was said that you were fired for selling WWE merchandise out of a, of a shirt store in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. it's, that's... Uh, totally lie. Uh, let me tell you the truth and then whatever they want to do, uh, uh, whatever story they have, they can come out with another one because I'm going to tell you the real one. Okay. I bought, I was invested in the shirt shop. We had all the merchandise that we had was bought through licenses in out of California. Uh, we did, I did have my shirts made up with the WWF logo. Then it came to WWE logo. A warm, nothing was ever said. The other guys, the agents liked them. They got some made. And this was before I was involved in the store. Way before. Everybody wore those shirts, nobody ever said a word. When the WWF changed to WWE, Stephanie McMahon got me to make the patches. Oh, I told her, I said, I know a guy that makes make those patches. We need them right away. She needs them right away. 
So we make the patches. I've got, I've got one at home in a referee shirt today. And we used them. Nothing was said. Nothing. So the shirts that they would give us would be so big, so bulky on me, that I could sleep in them. And so I decided, well, hell, I'm going to get my own shirts made. And I didn't, you know, I, I didn't consider stealing. Working with somebody for 17 years, and then all of a sudden you put a logo on a shirt 10 years after you, WWF and it's been there for all that long. I even had my name on. I got my name put on. So everybody knows the difference is Dave and I when they see us. So everybody went holler, hey Dave, hey Dave. You know? And they liked them. All of a sudden, why does it come to all of a sudden I'm selling WWF merchandise? Well, I was selling merchandise. But they claimed that I was selling their logo with their sh shirts with their logo on them. So the shirts that were in the St. Louis store, they came from? St. Louis. So they, were, they were printed in St. Louis. No, the, the 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 dress shirts that the agents and like myself wore come from the store in St. Louis. The the ra the wrestling shirts, whatever picture was on them, Batista, Triple H, everything was bought out of California at a licensed place. Same way with uh, the dolls and everything else. Everything was licensed. But you probably also heard the same rumors that I'm bringing up now that that part of the claim was that those those were either. Uh, Bootleg? Uh, bootleg or uh, came in through a, you know, a door other than directly from the licensing. That's, they were, that's a lie. Okay. Because I would have, why would I risk my job, the money I was making, for a $20 t-shirt? Right. Why would anybody do that? If, I mean, it didn't make sense to me. Have you been given any other reason uh, why you were fired other than that? No, that's it. Which... It's still not the true story. Uh, I don't know if the true story will ever be told, but there's more to that story than the shirts. I can tell you that. What, what I don't can you tell us that you know, your, it would be fair in your defense? Uh, in my defense, I just feel like there's somebody there that didn't like Dave or me, or one of us had too much power that knew, some, knew too much or knew what was going on, and they were jealous of it. So... And and to be honest with you, I think it was David. So you think David David was the one that had the target on his back and and, and I, I ended you up. You were fired the day after, right? Was yeah, I was fired the day after because John Leonidas didn't have enough guts to fire me that day. He had to wait till I went home and called me on the phone. I said you're fired because Vince don't trust you with his money. Twenty four years I've been there. I've car carried millions of dollars. That was just something that he came up with. But I also think uh, uh, by them, they could never get nothing. Johnny, or whoever who it was, could never get nothing on David. And I just happened to be at the target at that time where, oh, God, look at this. And the guy in the shirt <coughs> shop did make cards where I was part owner, or owner, which I was not. I just invested money in it. Are you still an investor in that? Story? No more. It was about a week after that. I got rid of everything because I, I, he, he did sell. He did sell some outsiders a, a short because uh, in fact the short was sold to uh, Rich Herring. Rich Herring, the, the guy that works up for Vince. He's like a judge or was a judge and something takes care of all the legal work. Okay, so he went down there and bought one, and Nick was. Uh, you know, stupid enough to sell him one, which I told him, you don't sell this stuff to nobody. It's, if you want to sell it, sell it to the agents, myself, and the rest for what it costs. And he did. He sold everything for what it costs. But to me, back then, this is when it was WWF, so we've gone so long with them, him making the shirts before I ever was involved in the company. They had nobody ever sent them. So why does it fall down right here? It's, it's like the Bret Hart deal. It's just, it's been going on, going on, going on. All of a sudden, boom! It didn't make sense to me, and that's why I'm saying that's not the. That's just the story, that to get rid of me and Dave. But there's another story behind the story. But if they're going to tell the story, tell the true story. Sure. You worked for Vince McMahon for 24 years. Did you have any correspondence with him since uh, Johnny Ace called you? No. Nope. I, I wrote him a letter. He not, he, he didn't answer it. Um, I faxed one to the office and had it. Delivered carried over to Vince's secretary and I still hadn't heard anything. How does that make you feel? I mean, you, 
Well, Describe how well you were treated for your entire tenure there. Well, you take 24 years of nothing but loyalty, give them everything they ever asked for, put my family on a back burner to go do something for them whenever they wanted it. Hey, heaven will do it. My wife will tell you. They call me, Hunter's got a book signing in Miami. Well, I just got home on Wednesday. Well, we got your flight, but we can't get you there in time Friday for it. Can you leave Thursday night? Yeah. I mean, everything. I have done everything I've ever asked for. Done everything for them. Caught people stealing money from them. Uh, everything. And to be treated like this. Now, where's the loyalty? I mean, Hogan. Bischoff called me one time. Called, got in touch with my wife. Do you know how to get in touch with Dave? Yeah. Wanted us to walk out on Vince. We said, no, we're not going to do that. You're too loyalty. And then this is what I get and he gets at the end of 24 years of nothing but the best for him. Eat, breathe, and sleep. WWE, WWF. And this is what we get because he hires some John Lenitis in there, who wants every WCW guy he had down there, so he gets rid of all the WWF guys. I mean, where's Jack Lanza? Dave Hebner. He hires Dean, uh, Dean Malenko, which I'm not mad at those guys, but he gets him a job, he wants to get rid of me. He comes to me, hey, I'm going to have to cut your pay $25,000. I said, what? Yeah, $25,000. We're going to put you on salary. I said, well, how much did you pay the other guys more money than you pay in me? Well, they do finishes. I don't care about finishes. When they had a $45 seat at a, at a venue, and I go tell the guy, hey, I want, I want you to put me 200 more seats down here, $8,500, so my job is that important? Their job is important? And I'm really hurt over it. I, my heart is tore out because of uh, the way I was treated. I mean, I was treated unbelievable. It's like somebody taking a, a, a bucket of mud or something just throwing it on my face. Is there, is there anything that Vince could do to repair the damage? Well, he won't even call me. And he goes and, like I say, hire John Lanitis. Must, must think he's the uh, smartest guy in the world. He, he's a liar and he's a maggot. That's what he is. In short, I mean, this is you know a political thing between you and, and Johnny. Uh, have, have you ever been involved in the political game before this? No. I mean, I worked for Pat Patterson when he was a booker. I worked for Jr. when he was a booker, and never had it in any trouble, any trouble. You can call anybody at that office and ask them about me. They'll tell you. Call any building in, in in the United States. Go overseas. Call Tokyo, Hong Kong, and ask them. Dave Hebner. I tell you, the greatest guy ever been here. The greatest guy that's ever been there. Do you think Vince McMahon truly feels that your uh, dismissal was over T-shirts, or is he backing up uh, Johnny? He's backing Johnny. If he if he wasn't backing Johnny, then why wouldn't a man come and talk to me? He hired me before Johnny ever come there. So why wouldn't you come if you if you hired me, and if I did something that bad, which I was. Not, had nothing to do with the shirt shop, nothing to do with nothing. He wanted to get rid of me. That's what he wanted. I was probably just a little bit better than him, and he couldn't stand it. Well, you've been biting your tongue over there, but you look like you've been jumping in a few times. Well, I think firing David, they fired an innocent man. Totally innocent. Firing me, I was involved in the shirt shop. So maybe that's a that that's one point for them. But that's just like I said, that's not the real story. You know. And for me and Dave to work for that man that long, especially Dave, for me to work there that long to do everything he wanted to do on our on earth, whether it was to screw somebody or whatever it was, I always done it. And you know, when when I when I got fired, I, I said fine because I, you know I was I was kind of stressed out, and like I said, that, uh, this WrestleMania 2005 would have been it for me, regardless. But I just don't feel like it was right because, if you want to put it this way, after all the shit that I've done for Vince, 
I mean shit. And for him just not to respond to my letter, I think it's bullshit. He wasn't too busy to ever tell me what he needed or what he wanted or what he had to get done. And he can't be that busy by not telling me to go to hell, you're fired, whatever he wanted to say, just a response. It didn't matter. It's not that I'm sent, I didn't send a letter begging for a job. You know, mm -hmm. because I had a job right after I got fired. And I, it was about a month later when I went back to work because I didn't, I didn't know what I actually wanted to do. And I still don't know what I want to do. I don't want to be in this business 24 hours a day, seven days a week anymore, or how many hours it is. It's about that. I'm longer. But there are some things down the road that I'm going to do and get involved in. But, you know, it, uh, it's just like, uh, you know, Vince didn't have to beg me to do what, I, what he wanted me to do. But it seems like I have to beg him to get a response. So I sent one letter, and I did find out or heard who got my letter and read it before Vince ever got it. So I'm just taking in, I'm just assuming that my letter never got to Vince. And if it did, if he can't respond back to me in any kind of way, just so I know he got it. And the letter said, I would like to come down and see you and tell you my version, the true story from what you've been told. Not saying, please give me my job back. I need my job. That's not the point. The point was, just let me tell you the story. Mm -hmm. But maybe, uh, maybe he doesn't care. I have no, no clue. But he cared when he needed me to do something for him. And all I wanted was an answer. And I never got it. So. You, you mentioned some of the you know, good guys, the wrestlers that are still up there. Have you heard from any of those since you're dismissed? Shawn Michaels called me. Rick Flair called me. Batista. Even Sean and Undertaker went to Vince and wanted Vince to hire me and Earl back and talk to him. So well, let's wait a while, you know. I mean, it, like Earl says, he, he sent a letter. John the Knight has probably got the letter, file 13, you know. And like I said, I've done nothing but good stuff for that company. We had a guy, promoter over in uh, Canada, stole $100,000 from us. Two different sets of tickets. I caught the guy, got every dime of it back, and then they're gonna tell me they don't trust me with Vince's money? Come on, man. Come up with something better than that. I called Human Resources. I said, why was I fired? It's not to be talked about. Well, if you're gonna fire me, tell me why you fired me. You know, give me an answer. And then a package. I said, well, do I get a package? We. John Donaita said, you don't deserve anything. 24 years of loyalty. 24 years of doing everything. I mean everything I was ever asked to do. Beyond of duty. Do you think they'd send Dean Malenko out here to a book signing with Hunter? No. They'll send Dave Hebner. I mean everything. And I'm not mad about the books. I, I don't care what I do. I work. I work. I give them 100%. I work. And they really took a big, big chunk out of my heart. Believe me. It all sounds like they did as well. You mentioned earlier that your only payment from now on in wrestling is, is the check you get. Right. Um, I will not be, I will do my job. But loyalty doesn't pay. Get fired for a lie over t-shirts, a $20 shirt, maybe, if that much. You're gonna risk your uh, six-figure job for them? It doesn't, it just doesn't make sense, and it's not the truth. But, you know, those saying in this business is, bookers don't last long. So the next, book, next booker that comes in may say, hey, you know, the heavens are pretty good guys. Maybe we need them. Then again, maybe they won't. But most of the time, bookers don't last forever. I mean, look at the business. You guys know the business. You've seen who's booked here, who's booked there, who's done this, who's done that. Eventually, everybody runs out of ideas and they run out of bookers. So a new one comes in. So somebody down the road, there's got to be somebody that knows what a good job we did. And if the booker is that jealous of the Hebners, he's a sick person. Is so the Vince McMahon that, that you knew in 2005 the same guy that you knew 20 years ago? No way. No. 
Not even close. I never ever thought Vince would ever do this to the Hebners. Never in my life. That would have been that would have been the last thing in my life to have somebody do that. Out of everybody. Like I said, I put God first and I put Vince McMahon second. And everywhere I went, I said nothing but good things about Vince. Nothing but good things. And then he can't even return a, a phone call, a letter, or get his secretary on the phone and says, Dave Vince, what said this or that? I mean, you know, just give me something. Give me an answer, you know? 24 years, I gave you an answer every day for 24 years. You can't give me an answer? And did everything. I mean everything. Loyalty person right here. Put my family second so Vince could be first. And everybody knows it. Everybody knows me knows it. I want to thank you for giving your side of the story. I know it's a particularly painful topic and the wounds are going to heal. But if I could ask you to end it on a good note, uh, address the fans that you, know, you were involved in so many of the greatest memories that wrestling fans have had, if you could just close it maybe on a positive note and say goodbye to us. You know, we had a nice time, and we love all you fans out there. And all you fans love the us, and you know it, I know it, and Earl knows it. So we'll see you down the road. i like to say that uh, I've done a lot of good things in this business, and I've done a lot of stupid things in the ring. But at all respect, I respect every person that ever bought a ticket to come in to see the WWE. And I enjoyed every minute of it, and I'm home. If I ever decide to come back, I'll let all the fans know right away. I'll pick a, put a big ad on TV like I'm running for governor or president. <laughs> but other than that, uh, I hope to do some independent shows around the world, somewhere around here, just to keep, keep, uh, keep alive and let everybody know how I'm doing. And whether I go back with WWE or not, it's not a big deal to me. But I, the time I was there, I enjoyed every, uh, every day of it for 17 years. Uh, Vince McMahon... I really can't say too much bad things about him. He was good to me for 17 years. And however, the fans were even better to me. And I'm going to miss you all, but uh, I'll be around, whether it be with WWE or some independent show.